New Creation Church presents Do religion have you thinking in the box? Then break out of that religious thinking and live outside of the box. This message is entitled Outside of the Box with Pastor Michael Porter. Where to start here? Well, just let me, let me, let me. Heavenly Father, I thank you today. Your goodness and your graciousness. We're absolutely nothing without you. Totally, totally undone. You're everything. We're nothing, but you've made us who we are in you. And we thank you for that. We're dependent upon you. Absolutely dependent. And uh, no flesh has any honor here, any glory. No flesh can accomplish anything. And so, Lord, we just thank you for your spirit that's in us, working through us and that you gave to us. So Abba, we thank you. Amen. Your goodness, your graciousness, your kindness. We thank you that your presence is here. It's enough for us. This is enough for us right here. That you are here with us and your love is in us and working through us and around us. Amen? How many people can say, Father's enough? Amen. He's good. Good enough, right? He's enough. He's really more than enough. Let me say that. I've been, I've been doing some thinking about John the Baptist lately. And so I'm going to take you to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew. And I want to show you something that John the Baptist said. I, um, you know, everybody has favorites and things like that. I, you know, most people in here know the book of Hebrews is one of probably my favorite book in the Bible. They're all good. John the Baptist is one of my favorite people in the Bible. And he said some really wonderful things. Let me just say this. John the Baptist is the last Old Covenant prophet speaking here, bringing in a conclusion to thousands of years, thousands of years of uh, a religious system, laws, and uh, prophets and kings, and what God has been doing in all of those things. Sometimes, you know, if we're not careful, we try to divide the word in Old and New Covenant. It's, you shouldn't divide it. It's all one thing, a picture of Jesus. That's it, right? You might have a title, a testament or a covenant, but it's all one thing. So John the Baptist is coming on the scene at the right time because an end is happening to one thing and a new beginning is approaching, right? And we won't preach on the, the Jordan experience with Jesus. I want to talk to you about something he said. He works good here, don't Sister Mary? <laughs> he should cut off in a minute. All right, now we know. Don't turn it up to 72 next time. All right, we're trying to guess 72. Maybe more than that in here. I don't know. So John the Baptist is, is uh, in chapter 3 and other chapters. Uh, he gives some, or some other books, but I'm going to read Matthews here. Uh, in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And John himself was clothed in camel's hair, leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Jerusalem, all Judea, the region around the Jordan, went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You know what my Sunday school teacher used to tell me, right? You know, the, the uh, Sadducees, they, they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all remember that? Yeah. It's amazing how those things steer. And he said to them, brood of vipers, wow, what a greeting. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore... Every tree which does not bear good fruits cut down, thrown into the fire. And I indeed baptize you with water and to repentance. But he's coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean the, his threshing floor and gather wheat into the barn. But he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. I want to focus on this one statement right here. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. All right? So, usually I know I have it nice and neat on the screen, but not today. I have it nice and all over the place on my paper. So, here you got. He's telling these, these religious people 
are coming out, these religious leaders are coming out to see what John the Baptist is all about because John is creating such a commotion out here in the wilderness, right? Everybody's coming out to be baptized by John. It's a new thing. It hasn't happened before. And John is baptizing people with water. We all know he's a precursor, a foreshadow of Christ. He's pointing not to himself, right? We just read it, right? I'm not even the man who's coming after me, he said. I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. Talk about humility, right? Here comes John. Jesus said of him, the greatest person ever born of a woman. John the Baptist. Jesus elevated him to that. Why? Jesus can elevate you. But John of himself said what? I can't even tie this man's shoes that's coming after me. He's basically saying, look, don't look at me. Look at the one I'm pointing you to. That's what he's saying. And so John the Baptist has the ministry that every ministry needs to be. Don't look at me. Look at the one we're pointing you to. The one we're pointing you to is greater than us. We're not even worthy to tie his shoes. Now Christ has made us a lot of things, and that's wonderful for Him to say, but it's not, we always want to have the, uh, the um, mindset of what? Humility. Lowly, lowliness, right? That's the principle. So hang with me. I'll get you to somewhere. So John, is he's saying these religious leaders come out, and here's how they come out. They don't come out, Brother Rick, in humbleness. They come out in all their religious garb and they come out in all the pride they have and we're the sons of Abraham and we're the religious leaders of the country. And as soon as John sees them, Brother Keith, he calls, he says, brood of vipers, who has told you to flee from the wrath to come? I mean, John is very confrontational out here in the wilderness because that's his assignment. You've got one thing coming to an end, another thing be beginning, and John is preparing the way for the Lord, making his path straight, right? Here's what John is really saying. He's saying, look, if you think you're going to come down here to the Jordan and I'm going to baptize you, you can't come in your religious thinking. Because, let me say this to you, you can't find the Father in religion. You can't find Him. You can find religion and they'll talk about the Father, but you can't actually experience God in religion. God is to be experienced how? In humbleness of heart, in lowliness, and God is to be experienced in the Spirit, right? Amen. And so John is saying, you can't come down here with your religious attitude and think for one moment, I'm going to baptize you in this water. You're going to have to come down off your high horse and come down here in lowliness of mind with a repentant heart, and then I'll be happy to baptize you. Because that's what everybody else was doing. John baptized me. I'm a sinner. Right? I've fallen short. I'm going to use that term. Fallen short of the glory of God. They're coming in humbleness. We need you, Father. Look at us. We need you. And John is what? Yes. Be cleansed of your sins. Be cleansed of your sins. He's saying, look, I'm baptizing you with water, brother, but hold on. It's not about this baptism. It's about the one who's coming who will baptize you with fire. So this is a scenario. He looks at him, Brother Rick. He says, oh, you think you're children of Abraham. Picks up a rock and says, Father is able to make children out of these stones, children of Abraham, if he so desires. Mm -hmm. So what is he saying? He's saying, look, oh, let me, let me bring it into our culture. Oh, so you think me and Sue will do this. You think you Pentecostal holiness. You need to come down off of your high horse. <laughs> Because you're Pentecost, I'm not picking on Pentecost on these people for you YouTube viewers. I could say Baptist, Methodist, whatever church you got in Christ. I could say anything. You've got to come out of your religious thing. Do you think you can find Father in your religious thinking? That's what John is saying. He can't be found. He's not boxed into some religion. And let me just say this to you. All of us grew up in some church culture. And I'm not putting down that, but I'm telling you, the church culture that we grew up in, we can't find our Father in our church cultures. And John is saying, if you really want to know your Father, you're going to have to stop this religious activity. If you're going to come down in this Jordan and experience this God, you're going to have to humble yourselves. Amen. I don't care who your Father is. Unless your father is the one father. Yes. Abraham was a righteous man, the Bible said. Yes. And I suppose a good man. But he's not, what, superseding <coughs> the only father. This is why the scripture says, what? Call no man father. Yeah. Right? Call no man father. So we're just giving you some background. So that this is what's going on. He says you need the fruit of repentance. You need to humble yourself. 
John was saying, as far as religion is concerned, legalism is concerned, here's what he said right here. You better put an axe to the root of that tree. He's saying, if you're going to come in religion and religious activities and rules and regulations, if you're going to come in legalism, let me tell you, you can't find Father in any of those things. You'll never experience God in religious activities. Here's what you need to do. Lay an axe to the root of that tree and chop that tree down. Because you can only find God in spirit and truth. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry. It cuts me just like it cuts you. So what are many people deciding to do today? Chop down the tree. If the tree is keeping me from experiencing God, the tree's got to go. And I'm not putting down anybody's association. That is not the purpose of what I'm saying. I'm saying, look, there are no associations who can get you to Father. None. Is it wrong to be in a... No, you can be in all the associations you want to, but your relationship is with the one Father. And how do you approach Him, Brother Keith? In loneliness of heart. And in great need in the Spirit, right? And what is He? Gracious to supply. What is He waiting on? He's waiting on that very thing. And John's saying, this is how you've got to approach God and he's lambasting the religious leaders of the day for doing that, right? So, look at that. looking at that word uh, trees in the Scripture, he said you better lay an axe to the root of the tree. If you look at the word tree in the Scripture, not detailed, but in a little bit of surface, it means to, it, it oftentimes depicts people, and I'll show you some verses for that, uh, but if you look at the word axe, I'll do that first. It means to break, to be torn, a fall, a ruin, to separate from its parts, to break up, to destroy, to put off. The word axe. You better lay the axe to the root of the tree. You better break off, destroy, put away, undo. What is he saying? He's saying you better put away your mind, the consciousness that said, I'll get to God just based on religious activity. You better put an axe to the root of that tree because you'll be chasing God all of your days in this realm and never find Him. You'll find religion. You'll find religious activity. And let me say this to you. It'll never fulfill you. And this is why many people go to church all the time, Brother Robert, but they never feel full. Because they never find their Father. They just find things. And as good as things are, Sister Mary, they don't last. They never make give you peace. You can do all the rituals you want to do, but they'll never give you peace. You may get momentary comfort or something like that, right? John's saying, you better, this is how you approach God. Put an axe to the root of those trees in your life, right? All right, so he said, uh, destroy, mailed it, put it off, ruin it. All of those things are in the meaning of the word axe there. So when a tree is uprooted, I was going to draw it on the board, but I don't have my board down here yet. So just think about it. If we took a chainsaw, and we cut down a tree. I've, you've seen that before. The, the roots are still there. The trunk is still there. And over time, the tree may regrow again. Get new sprouts and regrow if you cut it off with a chainsaw. Mm -hmm. But if you uproot a tree, if you pull it completely out of the ground so that its root system is gone, that tree is dead and it cannot grow again, right? Yeah. Because if you remove the root, you remove the life. And that's what John is saying. You better lay the axe not to the tree, you better lay the axe to the root of the tree so that we can get the whole thing out and get it gone. Why? Because it needs to die so we can live. We can't live in the Father until all of our religiousness dies. In my consciousness, all of my religiousness has to die. And I just can't cut it off. I have to root it up. Because when it goes, look, Father is in you in the fullness. It's not like He's out here somewhere and He's got to give you more of Him. We discover more of Him as we uproot all of these things that have been blinding us from Him. Amen. Amen. Amen? So what are we doing? We're uprooting things. John is saying, you want to know this one who's coming after me? You better lay an axe to some roots. Amen? Amen? <laughs> And I want to know Him. Who's with me? Amen. I want to know Him. I want to know Him in the fullness of knowing Him. 
So look, let's look at this in a picture of Jesus. Jesus took our old man, our old identity, our old self, and He laid an axe to the root of that old man. And Jesus completely, He didn't cut the old man off so that it had potential to ever come back to life again like that chainsaw cut down tree. Jesus uprooted the old man. He laid the axe for us. Jesus is the axeman in this scenario. And He laid the axe to the old man and uprooted the old man. Why? Because the new man could not come alive, be born, until the old man is put to death. And Christ, the Son of God, laid the axe to the old man. And I'm fully satisfied today that He killed that old man. And Pastor, not only did He kill him, He uprooted it. So that that old man can never live again. Can you say amen with amen. me? Come on, is your old man dead? Yes. Then what's left? Just the new. Just the new. Okay. Alright. So, um, I was... I was ruined. I was destroyed. I was... You could take all those words I said for acts. The old me was ruined. The old you was destroyed. The old you was torn off. The old you was broken into pieces. The old you was uprooted. Do you see that? The old man was what? He is dead. He's gone. The old man is dead. That's what the Scripture says. Not only is he dead, is he dead, he has no opportunity to ever live again. He's been uprooted by the Father. And now the new man lives. The new creation is alive. And this new creation man is what? Operating out of a different spirit. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus. This new man is full of life and the old man is dead. But here is my problem sometimes. In my consciousness, I forget I'm the new man. And I still think of myself as the old man. And so what is being renewed now? My mind. The old man is dead. But I have to know in my knower that the old man is dead. And that the new man is living. Because knowledge, whatever your consciousness is, is how you see yourself. And even though your old man is dead, if you still see him as not alive, he's still alive to you in your mind. Amen? You see what I'm saying? So it's about your consciousness. The more I'm studying the Word of God, the more I'm believing everything in this new, new uh, covenant is about consciousness and what you're knowing. Alright, let me show you uh, 1 John uh, 3. 1 John 3. We'll get to a, a good illustration of this in a few minutes here. 1 John 3, I got it up here. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might, the word is destroy, I added the word acts, the works of the devil. Now, we could go into a whole long teaching on about devil and who you think devil is and all that kind of stuff. But let me say this. <laughs> Look at this scripture. I grew up in the economy, the culture of thinking, that Satan or the devil was some lofty creature who sinned before God and fell and took a third of the angels with him. If you believe that, that's okay. I'm not putting you down. But let me just get you to think on this. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from when? So that wipes out the concept that he once was not sinning and then sinned and failed. Because he sinned from where? The beginning. The beginning. Yeah. That was his nature. And we won't go into a study of him because I've learned if you start messing with devils and hells, you get in trouble with people. And so what I want you to focus on here, the Son of God was manifested that he what? May lay the axe to the works. He may destroy the works, right? Not He may destroy anything that was contrary to who God had planned out, what God had planned out for you. Jesus laid the axe to the root of it and He destroyed it. And so now, I'm not living life fighting some entity anymore. It, why? What's the purpose? It's a waste of life energy to fight something that Jesus laid an axe to. Right. Why not live life? Instead of, I love the way Jesus tackled anything demonic. He never went around looking for it, but if it crossed His path, He dealt with it. And He kept right on going. That's the beautiful way to live life. I'm not looking for enemies, Sister Mark. I'm looking for life now. Why? The axe has been laid to the root of the tree. 
It's been destroyed. Amen? All right. Um, I want to give you this concept here. This is going to sound kind of weird, but let me be weird. We think in our minds that we're limited by time, by space, by matter, when in actual reality, we're not limited by any of those things in the Spirit. Our thinking makes us believe because it's still an attachment to the old man. He was bound in time. He was bound in matter. He was bound in space. But not us, Brother Keith. We are the sons of God. And like the pattern son, was not bound in time, was not bound by matter, and was not bound by space, could move freely throughout time and throughout space without effort, without even praying, just his consciousness moved him from one place to the other. So it is with the pattern son. So it is with the sons. But our thinking has caused us to believe we're less than that. That that was Jesus and we're not Jesus. Well, I've got news for you. Yes, you are. And anything the pattern son displayed, we can display. But I must rise to the level of thinking that I am that person. And the only way I can is I've got to lay an axe to the root of some things. Yes. And I do that right here. Because Jesus finished it in actuality for me. Now where is it going on? In my mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let me rephrase it. Whatever my consciousness is about myself, that's the person I am. Jesus, I don't want to use the word simply, but I'm going to. Jesus simply did all those things out of the consciousness of His Father. Yes. Yes. It was not Jesus being Jesus. It was Jesus being His Father. Yes, it was. <laughs> and the day we rise to that level of consciousness is the day this place no longer holds us down. Amen. That's the day we stop praying about sickness, sin, disease. We don't even think about those things anymore. Why? You can't get sick there. No. There's no sickness in the Spirit. No, no sickness in the Father's realm. No, dip, no depression. No difficulty. And if you're going through any of those, I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying, as I rise in my mind to the level of the pattern Son, I begin to manifest, and so do you, the same thing the Son did. Yes. Jesus put it this way. Greater works yes. show you do. You see that thinking, that consciousness? Christ in us, the glory. Amen, bro. Amen. All right, so you're not hindered by physical time and space. Let me show you um, Isaiah here. <clears throat> I can flip forward. Isaiah, oh, excuse me, this is Psalms 104 16. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he planted. The trees of the Lord are full of sap. <laughs> what is sap? <laughs> sap is life. Sappy. Right. Sap is life. I'm Come not on. trying to say you're sappy, but <laughs> in this on. case you are. Yes. The trees of the Lord, you, yes. are full of what? Life. Yes. What does sap do? It gives life to the whole tree, right? Yes. It brings it up from where? From the root system up through the trunk out to the branches yes. and causes the whole tree to be alive. You're the tree planted by the Lord. Jesus laid an axe to the old tree and put it to death and now you're the tree of life. And what is that life? The life of God. The Zoe life. Yes. And you're full of it. Thank you. Now this is one good thing to be full of. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. A lot of people told me that. Thank you. <laughs> On different occasions. <laughs> Psalm 1 through 3. This is the first Bible scripture I had to learn when I was a little boy in my house. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Look what he says it will be. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, and whatever he does shall prosper. He'll be like what? He'll be like a tree planted by what? The rivers of life, full of sap, full of life. 
This is who you are. This is your identity. Don't let this realm rob you in your consciousness and say you're less than that. You are the tree planted by the Lord. Jesus laid an axe to the root of the old one and plucked it up in its dead and you shall live and live forevermore and be full of life. And that's the thinking you need to have for yourself. Yes, yes, yes. And when it looks like, according to this realm, you're not full of life, don't let that deception bother you. Because this is the realm of deception. Yes. Things look like what they're not. Yes. But not in our kingdom. Yeah. Everything is real. Yes. Yes. Everything is truthful. Yes. You never be lied to yes. in this no. realm. You are the trees of the Lord. Come planted on, by the rivers of life. Yes. Full of the life of God. So yes. full of Christ. Greater is He who is in you. Yes. Than he who is in this world, this present evil age. Yes. yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Oh man, thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. All right, here's Isaiah. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, <coughs> that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Yes. You're called the trees of righteousness. You're full of life. You've been planted by the rivers of life. You know what you should expect? And me too every day. Life, life, and more life. We should expect life at every turn. And when this realm tries to show us something opposite, we don't have to agree with that opposite. Because in our minds, we know we're the trees of the Lord. Well, how are things? Well, are you asking me according to this world? Or are you asking me how things really are? Because sometimes in this realm, things don't look like they really are. Agree? Right. In this realm, I don't always look like I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But in truth, I really am, right? Yes. And so are you. Amen. And so here's the point I want you to see. As I develop my thinking, as I meditate on these things, yeah. as I spend time with my Father, as I dedicate myself to the Word of the Lord, as I grow and mature in the statue of the knowledge of this Christ, what happens to us? We see ourselves for who we really are. Yeah. And when we see ourselves for who we really are, we begin to manifest that very thing that we really are. Because now our minds are set on who we are. Yes. Nothing happened to Jesus to ever make Him change His mind about being the Son. Yes. The no. beloved Son of God. No. It was settled in His consciousness yes. who He was. And no matter whether it was kings or pilots or Caesars or leaders right. questioning who He was, mm -hmm. He never changed His mind about who He was. Mm -hmm. right. And so He did everything his father wanted him to do. Gave, empowered him to do. Amen? Right. Amen. Amen. Come on, say this with me. I'm a tree planted by the Father. Beside the waters of life. Full of life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. So let me talk about this in some terms here. It's not our bodies that need healing. It's our awareness that needs healing. Now look. I have ailments in my physical body, so I'm not putting anybody down who does. I have manifestations of my body challenges me sometimes. Let me put it that way. But it's not my body that needs to be healed. It's my consciousness that needs to be healed because as I grow in the consciousness of who God has it, who God is in me, then what? I manifest that very thing. And so no sickness, no disease, nothing along those lines, what? can have hold of the person who is manifesting the mind of Christ. And this mind is in you, right? Let this mind be in you. And that's the process we're in. This process of maturity is processing the mind of Christ and discovering the wonders of God's grace and mercy. Yes. Amen. It is good power toward us. Amen? Yes. So we're on a journey, if you will, of discovery. And I know everything is finished, gotcha. But I'm on the journey to discover the finishedness of it. Amen. Amen. Yes. 
that's such a word, the finishedness. <laughs> so we're full of life. We're producing fruit. And watch the purpose. That He may be glorified. Amen. Oh, wait a minute. Do hey, you mean to tell me the purpose is not so I can have a bunch of stuff and live a good life and have a good you want have homes in four cities. And I'm, if you got homes in four cities, hey, I'm not putting you down. Maybe I can go stay in one of them sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see the purpose of life? That He, Father, may be glorified. No one, the purpose of everyone who has ever been is to glorify the Father. Some have risen, some have risen to that level, and some have not. God's grace overall, who knows? But my, my thinking is this. There are a people, His delight is in the law of the Lord. There are a people who are now saying to themselves, I want more. Amen. Yes. I want to experience more. I want to know more. I want to see more manifestation. I want to experience God's presence more. I want more of you, Father. And if there are any trees in my life that an axe needs to be laid to, there's no more sin. It's all gone. Now we're talking about thinking. That's what we're saying. Sin has been dealt with once and for all. Now we're talking about our minds. If there's anything, Lord, I want to draw closer to You. I want You to manifest. Not that He's not. He's living in me. Don't get me wrong. You see what I'm saying? There are a group of people who are saying there is more to the current level of experiencing experience than I'm experiencing. Does that make sense? Amen. There's more to this thing. And a hunger is growing. A desire is developing. And some people are beginning the search for the truth. And let me tell you, you can search all the truth you want and you can find all the truth you want, but you better be ready for this. Some trees are going to be cut down. Yeah. And some of them are going to be sacred trees. Oh, you're going to stand there with that axe and go, oh, are you sure this has got to go? Are you positive? That this is something, boy. For nine generations we've been... Oh, you're gonna, you know how you take the practice swings and start remission? You're gonna do that. I'm just picking here, but you, you see my point? Oh, yeah. Some of them are sacred things. Yes. But, Sister Mary, if they keep me from experiencing Amen. God, I want to free them. Yes. Cut them yes. down, pull them up by the root. Yes. Even if it hurts a little bit, let it hurt a little bit because in the end it'll be better for me, right? Yes. So, He may be glorified. It's the purpose of all things that He may be glorified. Now, I want to take you to a scripture and show you this story in action, and it's in 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And then I'm going to, I'm going to let you get out of here. 2 Kings chapter 6. Thank you for life, Father. Thank you for life. We receive your life. We receive your life. We receive your life. We receive your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, we're full of life. We're full of life. We're full of life. Thank you that we're planted in you. We're planted in you. We can't be plucked up. We're going to live. We'll live in fullness of life. We'll experience the life of God. We'll experience God's fullness of life. Manifested sons. Manifested sons. Manifested sons. Operating in the, the life and the love and the light of our Father. That, that is who we are. We see ourselves as that. Father, we thank You that Your Spirit drawing us into You. Drawing us into You. Never willing to let us be satisfied. You're drawing us into You by Your own power. By Your own purpose. And by Your own graces. We give You the praise and the honor. 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 Father, we thank You. We thank You. We thank You. That you're not settled to leave us where we are, but that you empower us to move forward and you let change occur in our lives for the betterment of us to experience you. Lord, receive all the glory, receive all the praise, receive all the honor, receive all the accolades. We don't want any of them. You alone have up. You alone have up. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Second right. Kings chapter 6. Just a few verses here. And the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, 
See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam for there. Let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered and said, Go. And then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he said, I will go. And he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, here we are again, same place, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick, he threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore he said, Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand, and he took it. Alright, very familiar story. This is a picture. The sons of the prophets in this story are a picture of hungry people. That's what they're a picture of. The sons of the prophets. On a journey to discover the things of God. This is why they're at the, for lack of a better term, the school of the prophets, right? To sit under the prophet, learn the prophetic, learn about God. This is what they're in the process of. So they are what? Disciples. They're, they're wanting to low. They're wanting to know, excuse me, they're wanting to grow. And you can tell it by their terminology because they said in verse 1, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. In other words, what they're saying on our terms is, God, this is wonderful. We love what you have done, but where I am with you has grown too small for me. Let us make a larger place for you in my life. That's what they're saying. Let's have some expansion of the knowledge of God because I'm tired of this small place. I love it. You're wonderful. Your graciousness is wonderful. I can't explain it. But something in my spirit is telling me. I want to go on <laughs> to a larger place. That's what they're saying. The place we live with you, Elisha. In this scenario, Elisha is a picture of Jesus. He patterns the life of Jesus. They're saying, Jesus, this place we have with you, too small for us now. Can we enlarge our knowledge of you? That's what you're saying. Can we build a bigger space for you? And so what did they go do? Cut down trees. That's what they did. Right? They went and cut down some trees. And can I say to you, you can have all of God in your knowledge. You already have all of God in your spirit. You can understand all of God you want to understand. But it's going to require some trees to be cut down. Amen? Some trees to be cut down. Alright, so they go along in the story. And they proceed to the Jordan to cut down trees. And I said, Elisha represents Christ. And... Um, he re it represents in the story a place too small for you. And you can use the Scripture, the connotation that would say things like this, set your mind, what? On things above and not things below. In other words, set your mind on large places, open spaces, open fields. There are no confined areas in the Father. Everything in the Father is wide open. And you can run through the fields of the Lord and frolic in them, right? Everything in this world is what? Confined. Boxed in. You can't go but so far. Don't question that. You better stay in this religious box right here. And if you try to get out of this, I don't know what will happen to you. I'll tell you what will happen to you. You'll see a larger space than you ever dreamed there was and you'll begin to experience greater things. That's what I'm saying. Let me get out of this small place into a larger place. God is so big you can't Amen. put a border right. I mean, come on. I can have all of the Father I want. Yes. And so can you. Amen? Amen? So, they ask Him, they say, can we go? Can we get to this larger place? And Jesus, Elijah says, yeah. Go. And then they said, well look. Will you come with us? And Jesus says, yeah, I'll go with you. He's saying, look, you want to know more about the Father? You want to experience your Father? Go. And while you're going, I'll go with you. Yes. Yes, what does it say about the Spirit? He will give.
guide you into all truth. Here he goes. He's not only giving you the prompt, go, go for it. Can I say it like that? Just go for it. What do you want? God, go for it. And the Spirit saying, go for it. And while you go for it, I'll go with you. And lead you to where you want to go. How about that? Does that sound like a good plan? Can I sign you up for that right now? Put me on the top of the list. Jesus is saying, go, Brother Robert. There's no need in praying about it anymore. If you want larger places, guess what, Brother Rick? Go for it. That's what He's saying. Go. Will you go with us? I'll go with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Who knows the Father better than the Spirit? He searches the very heart of God. And now He wants to take you into one.